Welcome everyone. Welcome everyone to the webinar Social Protection for Sustainable Food Systems, Blue Food Systems. My name is Juan Gonzalo Jaramillo Mejia, and I have the honor to, to moderate and host you today in uh, this uh, webinar that is a joint initiative between the United Nations Food Systems Summit Coalition and Universal Social Protection by 2030 Working Group on Social Protection and Food Systems Transformation. We move to the next slide. Um, I wanted to say that the uh, co this coalition that has been um, leading this policy and academic dialogues around a variety of different issues relating social protection and blue food systems is the result of a joint effort of several organizations which work together to enhance the linkages between social protection and food systems to achieve and accelerate progress towards SDG target one and two in tandem, uh, in particular in reducing poverty reduction, food security and nutrition and decent work outcomes. The beauty of this initiatives uh, is that it brings as you can say, multi, not stakeholder discussions, but also different sectors together, spanning international development, civil society, academia, national, local governments, which are critical um, uh, drivers of this. So maybe we can move to the next slide uh, to tell you a little bit about this coalition, which, as I said, is not just a coalition that speaks to food systems actors to uh, highlight the relevance and critical contribution that social protection systems and interventions can play to achieve SDG 2 uh, and its targets. But this is also a USP 2030 working group, which is uh, a coalition, a global partnership of critical actors, including governments, international organizations, private sector and civil society that want to accelerate progress towards SDG 1 and in particular target 1.3 which says that we need to build by 2030 um, national social protection systems uh, for all, including social protection floors. So it's by doing this that we will uh, safeguard, promote, and transform lives and livelihoods by achieving in tandem food security, healthy diets and nutrition, and decent work, um, resilient livelihoods, um, and, and better options for people in their wealth and their human capacity uh, to provide for the food that they need, the nutritious food they need. We will go to the next slide. Uh, today, uh, it's a special day, not just because we, we have an amazing group of speakers that I will introduce very soon, but it's also because today we are celebrating World Ocean Day, and we are not alone as a coalition. We're here with the Aquatic, Blue Food Coalition that has an objective of bringing aquatic foods into the heart of food system decision making, shedding light to a blind spot or a bias that we're always thinking about farm based uh, food systems. And today we're celebrating World Ocean Day, uh, June the 8th, every year. So you now you mark it in your calendar uh, as we effectively engage the public, inform policymakers, and unite the world to protect and restore. Uh, our shared ocean, ocean and, 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 and support a stable climate and create a stable climate. Um, this is it's great uh, that they're part of, of this, this coalition um, and, you know, of this event as, a, as an aquatic and blue food coalition and that we celebrate together with this very critical discussion, World Ocean Day. Can move to the next slide. Today, uh, we're going to talk basically, and the objective in a nutshell of this webinar is to talk about how can social protection really support um, an uh, aquatic and blue food systems and foster linkages toward that, particularly by catering and serving the, the actors, uh, the, the smallholder fishermen, for example, the people that are, that are within this, this value chains, policy makers that are concerned about the environmental sustainability, um, of of oceans and 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 rivers as well and lakes uh, where people find uh, not just a livelihood but a key source of nutritious food. Um, so this is basically our objective today: explain the interrelation, how can we do synergies, and what are the efforts, both from thinkers uh, but also from policymakers, which we have today 
to really shed light into, into what are the efforts. And I would like now to introduce you to our panel. But before that, I want to remind you uh, that you, any questions uh, that you have, you should go not just to the chat, uh, to the chat here, but to the questions and answers box under in the, you know your options there. We see that we already have uh, great inputs for uh, within the chat. It's very lively people saying hello. We're very pleased to have you with over 47 participants at the moment. But we want, as we go on, I introduce you to our speakers um, that you use the Q&A chat box. Great. So today uh, I am very pleased I am uh, that I am as, as the chair of the food systems the Social Protection Food Systems Coalition and Working Group, I am sharing the moderation with Stefan Jean Hafstein, who's the Special Envoy on Ocean Affairs from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Iceland, and it's the Interim Aquatic Blue Foods Coalition Chair. Stefan is the former ambassador for Iceland to the ROM-based agencies that are all in charge on food security, nutrition, and rural poverty. And he was country director for Iceland's mission in Uganda, Malawi, and he was a program supervisor in Namibia. He is also the former city councillor of Reykjavik and media editor for radio, TV, and print. He has authored seven books, and his last one in Icelandic in 2020, The World As It Is. We're very pleased to have you, and for you to join me, Gonzalo Jaramillo Mejia, um, who I not only chair this uh, working group and coalition, but I'm also a WFP um, policy and program officer for social protection and the global knowledge and learning manager for social protection and the advisor for nutrition sensitive social protection as well. So very happy to be with you, Stefan. Uh, and and wow, seven books starting putting them in my in my and hopefully you as well. A, in your reading list. Today, we also have an incredible speaker uh, who is uh, Professor Guy Standing. He will provide a keynote speech. Um, and the, you know, Prof Professor Guy Standing is now a research associate at the School of Oriental and African Studies at the University of London. He has a PhD from the University of Cambridge and has written several books. And in particular, we've invited him here uh, to talk about his latest book, The Blue Commons. He has written extensively around basic income and the principles that can guide us to, to really achieve uh, social protection for all. And also an amazing book I love, uh, The Precariat. Uh, with a series of others that expand on his incredible arguments. So we have a social protection person, an expert, a leading thought leader here uh, that is going to uh, connect us to through his research on social protection and, and blue and the blue economy and the blue commons. We also have today, which is very important, uh, we have uh, the a representative of INVEMAR, uh, which is the Institute for Marine and Coastal Research in Colombia, my home country. What a coincidence. We're very happy to have Mario here. And in Vemar, uh, it's it's a it's a technical agency from the government, and he's the coordinator on you know the assessment and how do we make the most out of the 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 the, the resources that are within the, the blue economy and in the coasts of Colombia. So very happy to have you. We can move to the next slide. We have Jose Luis. Chikoma and Daniela Kalikowski from uh, FAO in particular. So Daniela Kalikowski, it's a Brazilian national who uh, leads the work on linking, uh, you know, the fisheries, the works on fisheries and social protection for several years. I had the pleasure to work with her, uh, but she's really advancing the work on 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 these linkages particularly in the in the in the context in the current global context where there's greater attention uh, towards this part of the agricultural sector and then we have Jose Luis Chicoma who's the former minister of production in Peru who's an expert in sustainable food systems and uh, has had several high level positions in Peru's public sector including not just being the minister but also the vice minister of small and medium enterprises 
and industry. So we're really happy to have you all uh, really, you know, an amazing panel of experts. And, um, you know, I would just like, before we continue, that we give the floor to Stefan to introduce the coalition uh, in the next slide, potentially. Then, great, so people remember that they can make any questions uh, regarding it uh, in the chat box. Thank you, Stefan. Thank you very much and, and a happy Ocean Day, all of you. Um, as you can imagine, it's a big day for us here in Iceland. Uh, it, the ocean is the biggest thing we know. It's, it surrounds us everywhere we look. And uh, and uh, last weekend we celebrated what is a national holiday in Iceland. It's a Seaman's Day. So it's very fit that today we have a ocean day. Um, the Aquatic Blue Food Coalition was the only action group coming out of the United Nations Food System Summit two years ago, specifically addressing SDG 14, uh, live underwater. Uh, to meet global food security and climate goals, and by implication, of course, SDG2, zero hunger. Uh, this coalition is multi-sectoral, and it is with active participants from government, the private sector, academic institutions, and NGOs. And our key mission is twofold. Raise the profile of blue aquatic foods in discussions of the future of food systems, highlighting the relevance of aquatic foods to the SDGs and the priorities of many government decision makers. They need to know and they need to act. And then we want to mobilize support, including investment, technical capacity, and so on, for countries or group of countries which are setting out to integrate aquatic blue foods into the food systems. And I must say that during this period, more and more of us have realized that the biodiversity nexus, the food nexus, and the climate nexus, this is all interconnected. And, and uh, blue food can actually be one of the solutions in the climate di dialogue. Now, I hope that in the last two years, the co our coalition has matured into a, a valued contributor whose members are sought out to speak in international dialogues and and uh, and conferences and so on, on the importance of healthy fisheries in ocean and inland waters, the importance of expanding sustainable aquaculture, and the need for agri-food infrastructure to support valuable vulnerable communities. And we keep an eye on vulnerable communities. All is for, I mean, we want to empower those who are mostly most in need. We have also built bridges to other coalition, like the one we are sharing the platform with today, uh, the School Meals Coalition, Healthy Diets Coalition, uh, uh, plus other entities. And to give you one example of a practical work we have done, we have laid the groundwork along with others about expanding sustainable aquaculture in Africa. We, we had a workshop in January. We want to bring the, the multilateral donors to the table to fund not only big in industrial scale aquaculture, but mid-size and small-size aquaculture, because there is enormous potential in, in Africa. And we will have a special event in the FAO conference beginning of July on the as we say, the enormous potential of aquaculture in Africa. Uh, many of you know that SDG 14 is the least funded of the sustainable development goals. And, and this really has to be emphasized wherever we join. And uh, we are also pointing out, and not the least in the climate conference in Bonn this week and next week, where we have a special event, that evidence is growing that inland waters and ocean can play a crucial role in transforming food systems with climate-friendly production and nutrition for growing populations. So this, my colleagues, this is just the core of our operation. Uh, we are happy to contribute to uh, events like this. And we are really, really thrilled to see the strong lineup of panelists. All our coalition members are invited to be here. And I can see already some 
have joined the group. So I hand over to you and I look forward to hear the presentation. Thank you. Great, thank you, Stefan. It is, it is a great pleasure to have you with us today. Um, and without further ado, please allow me to introduce you to, to Professor Guy Standing, who, as, as I mentioned, has taught in many universities, been a consultant for many international bodies and advised several governments, and has recently published this new book titled The Blue Commons, Rescuing the Economy of the Sea, in which he looks at the exploitation of the oceans by overfishing, mining, waste, and rising temperatures. In this amazing book, he offers some very interesting ideas for creating new forms of common property to safeguard our oceans, and also has thought about how social protection plays a role uh, through the extension of a basic income, maybe, or many other measures. We'll hear from him directly. Professor, thank you for joining us. Thank you for your time. And the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, uh, Juan, and thank you for those introductory remarks. I should begin by wishing everybody a happy World Ocean Day. I think we'd all agree that the 71% of the world's surface that is covered by sea is given disgracefully little attention in the COP process, in many of the dialogues on supposedly green issues. It should be blue-green issues that we're looking at all the time. The second is I'd like to dedicate this talk to the work of my son, Andre Standing, who is working with small-scale fishers around Africa in particular, and it's doing what I think is, is wonderful work on gra grass roots or, or seaweed roots, whatever one would like to call it. Now, the interesting starting point is that going back to antiquity, even to the original common law uh, of uh, Justinian Codex, as it's called, the commons have included uh, the sea, the seabed, the seashore, and everything to do with the sea. And the commons is a particular form of property. It belongs to everybody. It belongs to everybody equally, and yet it doesn't belong to us as private property that is alienable, that is commodifiable. It must respect principles of governance. Principles include having government and international bodies as the stewards, the trustees responsible for maintaining the value of the commons, if not enhancing their value, and it also requires there to be strong uh, gatekeepers, those bodies to hold the stewards to account. And the development of a commons includes respect for a set of principles. And for my talk this, this afternoon, I just want to mention the three fundamental principles. The first is called the public trust doctrine. The stewards must preserve the value, just stated that. The second is the intergenerational equity principle. In other words, the stewards must make sure that the value and the benefits of today's commons are equitably shared with future generations. And the third is the precautionary principle. Nothing should be done with the commons unless due diligence has been shown that to minimize the damage done to the commons uh, as a result of those actions. And one of my implicit arguments throughout the book is that the tragedy of decommoning that's taken place in the sea, particularly since the end of the Second World War, in includes a lack of respect for all of those, those principles. Now, a blue commons provides the main food, all the seafood that we think we all know about. And it also provides the environment, the infrastructure that allows the continuation of the marine food. So it includes respect for seaweed, for coral reefs, for mangroves, for wetlands, the seashore, estuaries, and all that's in that ecosystem. 
And part of the problem that's been taking place is that the lack of a systemic approach, the lack of an ecosystem approach, is contributed to the tragedy of decommoning. Now, in all the sectors examined in my book and in others, decommoning can be described as a process of the development of rentier capitalism, in which the first thing that happens is encroachment, grabs of various sorts, then enclosure, then privatization, then commodification, and then financialization and a neo-colonial development. In all the sectors, it's, it, you can see what's been happening. And if I start with, with fishing, the tragedy of decommoning in marine fishing started in earnest in the 1945-1955 period known as the Great Acceleration, when in fear of a famine after the Second World War, Huge subsidies were given by the rich country governments to develop long distance fishing fleets, uh, purse seen nets, uh, long lines, vast technological change. But it was an encroachment into the sea of developing countries. And the overfishing crisis began at that time. But the real big change came with UNCLOS in 1982. Because UNCLOS, following from the Truman Proclamation of 1945, where the Americans started it, was represented a huge grab of sea as the state property of coastal nations. As we know, France, for example, got 11.7 million square kilometers of sea, the United States nearly as much, and it goes down the line. But basically, this was the biggest enclosure uh, of all history. And then once that the economic, exclusive economic zones were created, those 200 nautical miles from the coasts of coastal states, UNCLOS allowed a certain set of things to develop because it enabled states to start a privatization of everything in, in their area of, of the sea. And one of the worst features of UNCLOS was that because uh, rich countries were worried about losing access to fishing grounds, uh, it, UNCLOS required developing countries that couldn't uh, catch enough fish up to the maximum sustainable yield, a completely arbitrary concept introduced in 1949, to make fishing access agreements with, with foreign countries. As a result, over 300 fishing access agreements have taken place, enabling long-distance fleets from uh, powerful uh, fishing nations to maraud and take vast amounts of, of sea of, of fish from around the coast of Africa and Latin America and, 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 and Asia. And the, the, the fishing access agreements have been shown and I show in the book, and many of you will know this already, but most of the revenue generated by the foreign fishing fleets taking the fish from African countries, for example, the revenue has been mainly going to those industrial fishes, fisheries the use of fishing agents, fishing subsidies, and so on. And it's been, it's been a depletion and destruction of the blue commons, local communities unable to compete, unable to get quotas or whatever it is. And that commodification has allowed another development, which is the influx of finance. And this has been encouraged by the World Bank, by, by global uh, financial corporations in New York and so on. And finance, wherever finance goes, we're talking about the Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan, that sort of finance, they move towards a private equity model where they want to maximize short-term profits. And as a result, they globalized the fishing industry so that there's extreme conglomeration of fish production, and they basically can move wherever they wherever they want. And this has encouraged the primogenic nature 
of, of, of fishing. Global finance has been used not only to subsidize, but through structural adjustment uh, programs to encourage conglomeration and to see the blue commons, the local communities oriented to reproduction and reproduction of their communities as seen as holding back progress. And the, my view is that the, too much attention is given to mobilizing finance as if mobilizing finance is the answer to the problems that we're talking about, when really I think it's large part of the biggest problem. They're going for short-term profits. That's the nature of finance. That's why they do their business. And it's foolish of us to think that they won't act in that particular way. Now, what the industrialization of global fishing has done is destroyed the viability of local Blue Commons community and led to distress out migration, uh, a, a loss moving, a lot of people moving into becoming economic refugees and, and so on. And that story I, I develop in, in the book, which is well known to most of you, but I think it's an important thing to say it must get the high priority it deserves because that is part of the problem. The second sector I just want to highlight because I want to move on to the social protection theme uh, shortly is aquaculture. The same thing in, that has happened in fishing has happened in decommoning in aquaculture, encroachment, enclosure, privatization, commodification, financialization. And it's been dominated by the ideology of export-led industrialization. So all over the world, there's been a gradual shift, and in some places not so gradual, towards export-oriented commercial aquaculture with an emphasis, overwhelming emphasis on high-value export fish like salmon, like prawns, and you, you know, the, the other major varieties. Now, in the process of that, there's been a systematic destruction of mangroves. One third of the world's mangroves have disappeared since the 1980s. And one of the strangest phenomena is the development of the fish meal industry to service aquaculture. See, the fish meal industry as a neo-colonial activity is a strange thing, but that is the reality. So many of the fish meal uh, factories around Africa are run by the Chinese or some other foreign, foreign power. And of course, that disrupts the, the production system of the ecosystem of fish, and it leads to disappearance of pelagics. It's leading to stunted growth of, of big fish because they can't have access to small-scale fish because the small-scale fish are being used for fish meal. And ironically, much of the fish meal is not used for feeding fish, used for pet food or for feeding poultry or pigs in, in rich countries. And the strange phenomenon of how aquaculture has been allowed and encouraged to grow at the cost of destroying local commons is taken place in Chile. Chile, as we all know, has been a major fishing producer. And yet today, because so many concessions have been given for aquaculture and export oriented salmon and so on run by Norwegian firms and others, that the local fish, there has a shortage of it. You can't get it in the shop so much. And that sort of thing is, is happening in other countries as well. The third sector I just want to highlight before coming to what I want to propose is that mining and resource extraction are destroying the reproductive systems and the commons and undermining the capacity of blue commons to produce the food and the infrastructure needed for that. And of course, if deep sea mining takes off as a result of the weakness of the International Seabed Authority, eh, with Nauru having applied, if, if they were to go ahead, then the, the ecological dangers would be enormous. I want to highlight two things that don't get enough attention. One is the mining of sea sand. 
Sea sand is the most mined mineral in the world. And something like over 50 billion tons of sea sand are excavated every year. And because you can't use desert sand for construction, and you can't use sand from the deep sea because it's too salty and so on, it's leading to an erosion and destruction of estuaries and ecosystems uh, around islands and so on, and having a devastating effect. The other thing that I wanna mention just as by, by way of passing is how seaweed production has risen 1000 fold uh, since the 1950s and that's leading to a shortage uh, of seaweed. Now, what should be done? Well, I think that we should be focusing far more on reviving the commons. The commons, the commoners and com commons community are going to be far more oriented to reproduction, to preservation, to a respect for nature, a balance between nature and production, than finance which everybody's giving far too much uh, attention to. We must stop the World Bank deliberately converting commons into private property. The World Bank has had a target of making commons 70% private property by 2030. Why? This is not any showing any respect for the commons and what it does for the world. And we must stop corporate control uh, of regional fishing management organizations, for example, and stop the role of private equity growing inside industrial fisheries. But the big thing that I want to conclude on is that I believe we should encourage the establishment of what I'm calling in the book, Blue Commons Capital Funds in every country that has any blue commons, any coastal uh, communities, you could build up a commons capital fund through a system of levies. Levies on those who are making a profit from taking what should be a commons, and those who are depleting the commons as a result of their activities, like causing pollution uh, and so on. And what the book does propose is a set of levies some 12 in all, which would be a form of tax, but specifically for putting into the fund. The fund, like the Norwegian fund, would then have an investment strategy of sustainable revival of the commons. And in response to building that fund, as the fund builds, pay out to all commoners in their communities common dividends. And I explain in the book how that can be done. Common dividends are a form of basic income. And common dividends would be paid equally to every individual commoner. I believe that the levies, including a carbon levy, including a, a bunker fuel levy, including luxury cruise liner levies, uh, a fad levy, fish aggregation devices are a form of privatization that benefit the, the industrial fisheries is in a big way, flag of convenience levies, and so on. All of these levies are intended to have ecologically beneficial outcomes, and using the dividends, using the net returns on the investment by the fund to pay out commoners would in enable them to be able to rebuild or sustain commons communities. The intricacies are spelled out in the book, but this thrust of, of looking at it using a commons perspective and reviving the commons uh, is essentially what I believe is necessary in response to what is a globalized rentier capitalism, which is depleting the commons in every part of the world. So thank you for listening. Wow. Thank you so much. That's an amazing summary of your incredible book and giving us a little bit of history and a lot of food for thought uh, to think about how we are in this, in the blue food economy, really, the, the blue commons are taking 71% of the world, how we just not only need to green the economy, but blue the economy 
and understand what are the levers and what are the challenges that are often not being spoken out um, as widely and understood and, and embraced. And we, we're very confident that these arguments would continue to enhance the work of people like Daniela, like uh, the coalition members, to really highlight the challenges and far what action needs to be taken now and where social protection can be supportive of of commoning the the blue economy this is uh this is amazing thank you so much for that i would like now to just give um you know the word to and hear from mario rueda uh, just to kind of like take it down from this global thing thinking into what are the realities and the challenges that a country is facing. Then we will go back to the global, we will have Daniela telling us a little bit about what is the position of an organization as influential and as critical in this space as is the Food and Agriculture Organization, later to take us back uh, to one of the members of this blue uh, food system uh, coalition, who's the former minister of Peru. So that's the way we're going to do it. And we're going to be able to Toy and play with this, with this, um, with this um, different ideas. And honestly, incredible um, book. And thank you so much for sharing it with us. At the end, I want to say that we're going to have for those questions and answers that are coming that will still continue to go. We're going to have Stefan uh, to to really uh, be able to moderate any questions, any discussion within the panelists, and to give us some thoughts about so what do we do with this uh, from a blue food um, uh, food systems coalition, yeah? So then Mario, I would like to give the floor. Mario is a fisheries engineer and coordinator of the valuation and use of marine resources research program in Invemar in Colombia. And a, a critical thing that you all need to know is that his research focuses on stock assessment and fisheries managers of tropical resources, particularly in small scale and industrial fisheries. So thank you so much for here with here with Mario. Mario is going to do his presentation in English, but we will step in and up as needed uh, with Daniela to help with the translation uh, as, as he proceeds. So muchas gracias, Mario. Adelante. Okay. Uh... Perfecto. Podemos ver las, 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 la presentación. Adelante. Gracias. ¿Sí está en modo presentación? ¿Está ok? Yes. Sí. Okay. Eh, no en modo presentación. Todavía vemos las slides. Yeah. Eh, pero porque estás en, en, en dos pantallas diferentes. Mm. Ok. Ya. Se ve perfecto. Okay. Gracias. Perfect. I okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Gonzalo, for introducing me. Um, thanks for inviting me to this webinar. Um, hello, everybody. Um, I am Mario Rueda. Okay. Um, uh, I am here to to speak about a recent experience of a link between social protection fishing. Um, um, and food loots towards the transformation of blue food system in Colombia. Okay, the outline of this presentation considers uh, fisheries in Colombia, a uh, very concrete uh, exposition. And um, I'm talking about several study cases about responsible fishing, social protection, and food loss reduction. Okay, in this slide, you can see the map of our country, Colombia. Colombia have two, two, two coasts uh, on both oceans, okay? We have uh, both on the Caribbean Sea and the Pacific coast. Uh, this map represents the distribution of uh, fishing effort uh, of fishing intensity in, in 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 artisanal fisheries and uh, industrial fisheries also. Uh, the industrial fishing in Colombia is declining in the last 20 years. 
Uh, now, right now, only we have a fleet of tuna uh, uh, targeting resorts on the Pacific coast mainly. Uh, but our uh, our fisheries is focused in artisanal fishery right now. The other uh, uh, industrial fishing is the shrimp trolling, uh, especially in the on the Pacific coast. Uh, this map shows an um, one uh, important characteristics characteristics of the uh, our fisheries. We are in in the tropical country, so for example, uh, more than 100 species are harvested by uh, more than uh, 10 uh, technologies of fishing, for example, for small scale fishing. This is uh, to demonstrate that the uh, character of multi fleet and multi species uh, of our fisheries. Uh, related with the catch or landings, um, this picture you can see that the um, the landings are decreasing, declining in the last twenty years, uh, from the one hundred twenty um, twenty thousand tons. Um, today in, in these years is more or less forty thousand tons. Uh, the main uh, produce, uh, the main species catch uh, harvested is the tuna of the industrial fishing, but the uh, artisanal, uh, even though have a, a little landing, uh, is very important uh, to support the incoming the employment and the food security of the fishers living along the coast, more or less. Uh, 70,000 uh, fisheries uh, uh, fishers in the marine uh, fishers in Colombia for a um, uh, more scale. Okay, in my presentation, I want to present some evidence about how uh, responsible uh, uh, um, fisheries uh, apport to blue food uh, System. For example, we are uh, I am talking about several projects, uh, starting with the reduction of shrimp by cats uh, uh, for the shrimp trolling fishery, and social uh, the South Pro for fish project is a social protection uh, for small scale fisheries and aquaculture, and the food loss assessment project. Uh, all these projects were. Uh, implemented with FAO and several agencies like uh, uh, the 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 GED fund and the um, the agency for Nor Norway support the financial for these projects. Uh, in these projects, we obtained several inputs to affect the blue food system in Colombia and give support for environmental sustainability and human well-being. Okay, about the first uh, project is the main, uh, the purpose of this uh, webinar, the social protection uh, of uh, for more scale fisheries and aquaculture. It is the uh, social property uh, for fish project. This project have the objective to promote economic inclusion and pertaining the resilience and livelihood security of fishers and fishing workers to address the effects of disturbance of covariate, covariate crisis at macro and macro level by increasing the current scenario comprehensions, reducing barriers to access, uh, accessing to the social protection and promoting economic opportunities and better resource management throughout the establishment of synergies with other sectors in selected countries. We also, I say selected country because this uh, project is um, is developed in in several countries like Tunisia, Malawi, Paraguay, and Colombia. In Colombia, we have several pilot sites 
uh, for fishing and aquaculture. And this project to give support uh, several SDG uh, of the very important to submarine life and equity, equity, the gender equity, and, and poverty. Okay, we have uh, adopt the concept of social protection of FAO 2000, uh, 2017. And I say that the social protection is a policy set I mean to reduce social and economic risk and vulnerability, as well as alleviating extreme poverty and food insecurity. It's based on the three kinds of the programs, for example, social assistance, social security, and laboral market uh, interventions. But okay, why is necessary? Uh, the social protection in a small scale and fishing aquaculture. In Colombia, we identify several indicators. For example, for a small scale fishing, the associated activity uh, uh, considered that the fishermen belongs uh, and 50% of the fisher belongs to one organization. About the social security, 90% uh, of the fishermen as affiliate to the information system of beneficiaries since then in Colombia. Another data, another data says about the 90% of artisanal fishermen do not pay pension contribution. Uh, another uh, data say that the, there is no information of occupational hazards. Uh, another, for example, about the formalization. 94% uh, don't have registered on the, on his bot, for example. And uh, okay, there are, there are some data that uh, consider that importance to, to abort the topics about the social security to uh, confront these uh, dis disadvantages. In our project uh, of Sopro for Fish project, we conduct uh, two phases of these projects. Um, from since October 20, 2021 until September 2022, we obtained several uh, outcomes. For example, the revision of normativity and social protection programs in Colombia. This uh, uh, we can obtain several gaps of these issues and uh, to, to identify several recommendations. Part of they consider, for example, the uh, study about the impact of COVID-19 uh, in several uh, pilot sites, the impact of the COVID in the fishing and aquaculture. Uh, another gap in this uh, revision consider that there is no information about socioeconomic and social protection issues in the official statistics from Colombia. So we designed a, an employment, one module, a model a, of the socioeconomic and information in social protection inside the statistic, official statistics, statistic fishery system in Colombia. A, other issue uh, work working with um, uh, aquaculture uh, consider the evaluation of impact the self-managed funds is called fondos rotatorios uh, to to test if these uh, is are uh, successful or, or not. And the end of the the first phase of the project, we create the confirmation of the interinstitutional group for social protection of a small scale fishers and aquaculture farmers is the heat pro is very important result on our project. For the second year, um, we were we are working in several workshops uh, to, to demonstrate the operation of the heat pro. Uh, other issues consider technical and legal inputs to employment. Uh, one 
in, uh, to implement one in primary insurance do uh, the to the fishing bans is is a very important issue right now uh, to introduce this for the first time in Colombia. Um, we are working also in integrated in in integrated uh, information system for social protection and small scale scale using data of the collecting data with the official statistical system system in Colombia. Um, other issue that uh, we are working in the introduce several mechanisms to threaten and sales managed funds and the marketing of fishery product for aquaculture. And we are in um, great in employment workshops in regional GIPRO. So uh, not only we have the national GIPRO, we in several pilot sites, we are working in several uh, uh, with uh, fishing actors in the workshops of the regional GIPRO. Okay, the GIPRO. The GIPRO uh, is very important uh, outcome of this uh, project because he has several uh, objectives. For example, to promote the dialogue, the dialogue on the social protection in the country and his progress in the fisheries and aquaculture sector. Another uh, objective is to support the design of the re and review the public policies. And other another um, objective is to generate a space, a space to design uh, actions and alternatives that benefit workers in the sector. The GIPRO uh, has representation of all stakeholders at uh, national level with governmental offices. And uh, in the local uh, pilot size, the fishermen is part of this group, uh, also NGOs, academy, uh, etc. So it's a space very important to discuss uh, all the issues about the social security. I can say also that, the, for example, uh, uh, we are developing this. This project is in, is in progress. So, for example, the national development plan of the government of Colombia include a uh, aquatic food system in the social protection issues. Uh, and we are uh, working with the government to impulse, to, 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 to accelerate the inclusion of the issues about the social security in, in making decisions uh, for the fishing sector in Colombia. Okay, the other, another project is the reduction of bycatch. Why we are talking about this? And in this project, we testing technological changes and promoting bycatch utilization. Uh, this, uh, in, in, in the, uh, this project with funds of GEF, uh, we designed several fishing experiments uh, with fishers to uh, test several technological changes and use several indicators like shrimp catch, bycatch abundance, and fuel consum consumption to demonstrate the reduction of fishing impact with this uh, 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 fishing year uh, through the reduction of bycatch and reduction of fuel uh, consumption. The results indicated that the, uh, the, the, the and, uh, and other technologies reduce the bycast between 30 and 46 uh, percent without a serene catch reduction. Uh, we obtain until uh, 24 full consumption. And finally, we reduce the CO2 emissions to atmosphere, atmosphere with the vessel that use this, uh, this technology, new technology. Uh, so reduction of full loose and waste, uh, and waste is, a, uh, is a case of uh, bycatch utilization in this project. Uh, for example, uh, man, minimize the bycatch and maximize the bycatch utilization. The good example is a good example of 
are platoneras. Platoneras are the women fish workers uh, located on the Pacific coast of Afro-descendant people who process by catch, improving the handling and aggregating value to the bycats. We obtained several uh, uh, handbook and, uh, for the, for about the lab labor and work of these uh, women. And another uh, uh, project uh, in progress is the assessment of the uh, Pilus, uh, and, and the multidimensional solutions project in one pilot site into market. This project consider uh, topics about the uh, blue food system because we are uh, uh, calculated or estimate the losses, physical losses, quality losses, and economy uh, uh, th throughout the several phases of the channel uh, value chain of several species. For example, from, seen, from the fishing, trade, processing, and transformation, and storage and, and transportation. We, uh, can, we, we can to introduce several methodologies with FAO to estimate these losses and by products represent by uh, a scal uh, skeleton skins uh, heads of several fish pro products uh, we don't work with the west uh, west um, estimation because we don't consider in this study the the phase of the stage of the consumption uh, this is a good uh, one example of the value chain of a ring yeah, I throw the several uh, uh, states of the value chain, for example, fishing, trade, processing, storage, and transportation. Uh, we estimate in this uh, uh, study on auto consume or auto consumption for the fishing fishers in the boat by 4.28 kil kilograms. But for example, for each uh, a column in this picture, we can identify several reductions or losses by, by physical losses, quality losses, and economic losses to finally uh, to predict or to calculate the, the quantity of losses in this important uh, fishing product like serene. The one very important uh, result of this uh, of this work with uh, calculator loses is is the construction of, of one strategy in the small scale fishing value chain through the multidimensional solution to reduce these losses. Uh, uh, this um, uh, strategy in construction right now established that the, by 2030. 33, so in, in 10 years, Tumaco City will be a model district of consolidated strategy for 30% reduction of losses in a small scale fishing value chain that contribute to food and nutritional security and the improving of the livelihoods of the fishermen. Throughout actions, uh, and made to updating the employ, uh, implementing of the public policies the generation of transfer of the, of the knowledge assets to sustainable infrastructure uh, with appropriate technology, the development of new products, and the, and the diversification on markets with gender approach. Uh, right now, we are working in several activities to, the, to, to reach this vision. Okay, that's all. Um, um, you know, a con general conclusion established that these actions we consider in, is, is very important to the human well-being and uh, environmental sustainability in, uh, in our fisheries in Colombia. Thank you so much. Wow. Thank you, Mario, for really helping us to understand how our government uh, through which mechanisms and, and decisive action and so with the support of a technical agency like FAO um, can really extend social protection and make it a reality. 
uh, for those who need it the most. It's impressive to see, uh, you know, the the figures. Ninety five percent of the population who was unable to to access social protection and, and and a pension, for example. So all those efforts are much appreciated. And thank you so very much. Muchas gracias. So yeah. I have now we have thirty minutes in our webinar, but we have two very important presenters. We have uh, this is Daniela Kalikowski, who is currently leading the work on social protection and decent employment in the FAO Fisheries and Aquaculture Division. And then has over 20 years of experience, having previously served as the deputy leader of the FAO Strategic Program on Rural Poverty Reduction, overseeing initiatives related to collective action, climate change, poverty reduction, and social protection. So we're very pleased to have you, uh, Daniela. So I see you have your presentation. Let's put it up full screen and we can we can roll. See it in full screen or not? Because I see no. it here in full screen. No, not full screen. Okay, so I don't know why we are having this problem. Maybe it's because it's several screens. It happens to me that it, it we could have several screens. Be, it could be, it worked very, <laughs> Well, yesterday. So you you have, I think, uh, the presentation. Are you able to share it or? No, really. No. Okay. So let me see how this. How can I solve this problem? No worries. So always these technical issues are normal. No, I don't know what's happened because do you see anything now? Paula has taken over. Because I still I cannot screen. yeah, okay. Okay, I don't know how to solve this to be honest. Let's see. Okay. Um, now everything is blocked. Okay, let me try again. Still yes. not full. Well, we see it, it with the notes, screen? but it's all, but it's fine. Maybe we can do it like this. Ah, do you see it full screen or not? Yes, we see the outline. So it's Sophia 2022. Uh, yeah, but, but we see it with the notes. You see it with the notes. Yeah. Okay. So let's no, let's move it to the like notes. Yeah. Yes, fine. <laughs> I'm really sorry about that. Yeah. No worries. <laughs> no. So no. Thank you very much. It's my great pleasure to be here. No, today to present uh, FAO's work on social protection for uh, sustainable blue transformation. Uh, so I would like to begin my presentation uh, to draw some um, attention to the key messages highlighted in the FAO flagship uh, publication on the state of fisheries and aquaculture resources, uh, the SOFIA 2022, which centers around the, the concept of blue transformation. So this report, uh, which is a very important report for FAO, shed uh, the light on important insights and findings that are quite relevant to the sustainable development and management of fisheries and uh, aquaculture. So building upon this insight, I will then emphasize the role of social protection and how social protection can foster an inclusive blue transformation that ensures that no one is left uh, behind. Uh, do you see the next one? No. Okay, no, now yes. There you right. go. <laughs> okay. Perfect. So, well, the first message uh, of Sophia is that uh, global fisheries and aquaculture production reached a record of 2014 million tons in 2020, although it has suffered from uh, COVID 19 related impact. So the total, this total comprises of 178 million tons uh, of aquatic animals and 36 million tons of algae. And 90 uh, million tons of this production come from capture fishers, uh, actually a 2% drop from last year, mainly as a result of the COVID uh, pandemic, both 
considering uh, marine and inland fisheries, and 87 uh, million tons of aquatic animal production comes from aquaculture, and this represents a 2.7 growth from previous uh, year, but lower than the 4.5 uh, annual uh, average that uh, uh, attained uh, in the previous decade, again, as a result of, uh, of the pandemic. So of this production, uh, 157 million tons were used for direct consumption, human consumption, which is also a new record. So from uh, 1961 to 12, uh, 2019, the per capita consumption uh, of aquatic food, uh, excluding algae, increased at an average of uh, annual rate of 3%, twice uh, the rate of the world's population growth. In 2020, uh, this consumption dropped slightly to 20.2 uh, per uh, kilo, uh, kilograms per person as a result also of the, um, of the COVID-19. Uh, so let me unpack these global figures um, to highlight the very significant transformation that has taken place uh, in the sector in recent times. So three facts to show this. Uh, okay, so first, according to our uh, records, we currently exploit uh, almost 3,000 uh, species in captured fisheries, and we culture uh, over 650 of these, a unique diversity uh, compared to other food systems, uh, and at, as part of the sector's capacity to uh, adapt and evolve. Second, aquaculture continues uh, to grow in all continents, and in leaps and bounds, albeit from different baselines and remains the fastest growing food production systems in the world. And finally, the proportion of aquatic animal uh, products not used for direct consumption continues to drop, thus improving uh, its outcomes. So in summary, we have expanded what we produce diversified how we produce it and become more effective in what we used this production for. But the fisheries and aquaculture sector not only produces food, it provides also livelihood. The sector employs directly uh, 58 million people, over 90% of these in small scale fisheries. This highlights the necessity to consider their specific need and ensure their full involvement in the design and implementation of policies and management measures. If we add those uh, involved in the full value chain, plus the subsistence fisheries, it is estimated that about 600 billion people depend on the sector for their livelihoods. And the large majority uh, are in the global south. While only 21% of these employed uh, in the fishery uh, primary sector are women, uh, when we consider the full value chain, there is gender parity in the sector. So it really increases. So uh, gender-based constraints prevent women uh, from fully realizing and benefiting from their role in the sector. So applying a gender lens is not only changes how fisheries and aquaculture are understood, it will also change how we shape our institutions, our policies and actions to achieve equality and equity uh, in the sector. So fisheries and aquaculture continue to have a significant contribution to local economies, proportionally more significant in developing countries. So the total first value, first sale value of the sector was estimated uh, at around four 24 billion in 2020. 20, uh, uh, 20, uh, 225 states and territories entered the international trade of aquatic food, food products worth 151 million. And this reflects a 7% decline in 2020 compared to the previous year, also as a result of the pandemic, but indications are that this decline was fully reversed already in 2021. So the second message from, uh, important message from Sophia is that from an ecological sustainability perspective, fisheries resources continue to be 
under significant pressure, which demands all of our attention, but there are some encouraging, encouraging signs uh, to report. So the fraction of marine fish stocks within biologically sustainable levels suffered a 1.2% deterioration from the last SOFIA assessment, which happened two years previous to this one, and is estimated at 64.6% um, in 2019. But this percentage treats all stocks equally, regardless of their abundance and the volume of their catch. When weighted accordingly, FAO estimates that 82.5% uh, of the 2019 fishery landing were from bio biologically sustainable stock. And this is a 3.8 improvement from the previous assessment. So this is consistent with our view, with, our, with the academic analysis, that the larger fishery stocks with, the, with higher market value are better managed and that this manage, management is producing very uh, a promising and positive results. However, more work is needed to understand, address, and reverse the sustainability trends in many of the fish stocks. Paul's view is clear. Fisheries management is the most uh, effective tool to conserve and sustainably utilize uh, fishery resources. The third important message uh, from Sofia is that economic development and population growth will increase the expectations on aquatic food systems. We must ensure further growth is sustainable, equitable, and targets food security and nutrition needs. While um, recent transformation in the fisheries and aquaculture sector have been primarily driven by economic opportunities, how considers that more can be achieved if we are collectively, if we are collectively more targeted in guiding future transformations for the sector to be more productive, sustainable, equitable, and contribute to further to food security, nutrition outcomes, and livelihood support. So we call this vision the blue transformation, which is why Sophia 2022 has the subtitle of toward blue transformation. So blue transformation in it starts with an objective-driven vision. Its first objective is to ensure a sustainable aquaculture intensification and expansion that continues to satisfy the global demand for aquatic foods, especially in food deficit regions. The second objective is to ensure the effective management of all marine and inland fisheries following an ecosystem-based approach, because management works. And we also aim to eliminate illegal, unreported, and uh, unregulated uh, fishing in, or IUU fishing in, in all its complexity. The third objective of Blue Transformation is to upgrade and develop aquatic food value chains, reducing loss and waste. And I think Mario uh, presented a very interesting and promising uh, example of what's happening at the country level, no? promoting transparency and traceability, and ensuring inclusive and equitable returns to those dependent on the sector. So this vision is not, it's not going to be easy to achieve. It includes complex technical and policy decisions, as well as climate and environmental friendly action. It will require strong and well-aligned partnership to succeed. So let me unpack how social protection can play a vital vital role in supporting the three objective uh, outlines. So social protection can contribute to effective fisheries management by providing support to fishers and fishing communities, ensuring their well-being and enabling them to ad adhere to the ecosystem-based approach. For this, we need to have coherence between social protection and fisheries management measures. So coherence refers to a systematic promotion of complementary and consistent policies and programs across sectors, creating synergies to protect lives and livelihoods while managing the resource. So for instance, when we establish a, a fish ban, a no-take zone, a closed season as a management measure, they will be much more effective when affected, when affect fishers, if they are compensated financially during this restriction. So through an impact evaluation, 
that FAO conducted in partnership with the International Policy Center for Inclusive Development, the government of Brazil, for instance, we have observed the positive effects of providing unemployment insurance to fishers during closed fishing season. This measure helped minimize negative coping strategies, improved compliance with fishing regulations, had positive impact on the local economy, ensured children stayed enrolled in school, and created employment opportunities for the youth. So we aim to promote more of these initiatives and foster South-South cooperation, enabling countries to learn from, from, from those experiences and exchange their own experiences in social protection for the fisheries uh, sector. And I think Mario also um, highlighted the importance uh, of unemployment benefit during closed seasons in Colombia, for instance. However, uh, it's important to, to mention that globally, only 29% of the population is covered by comprehensive social protection programs. And when we talk about fisheries and aquaculture, uh, this sector is thematically excluded from the design and implementation of social protection programs, despite their vulnerabilities uh, that they face in the sector. Social protection is also very uh, crucial to advance decent working conditions. So by ensuring coverage, eradicating child labor, establishing minimum standards, incentivizing formalization and supporting inter entrepreneurship, social protection plays a vital role in enhancing the well-being and livelihoods of mar marginalized fishing folks. Social protection is also key to foster economic inclusion and graduation uh, from poverty. So, uh, by providing access to services such as markets, public-private partnership, finance, this can create an age engine for employment generation that will lead to economic growth. So by providing access to resources to cash or in time, uh, uh, this increased investment in risk-taking capacity uh, of fisher folk that also uh, include, um, strengthen the economic inclusion. And social protection increases the capacities and capabilities through cash and cash plus uh, programs that enable employability, employability and encourage uh, entrepreneurship. So connecting fish uh, lost and waste to social protection programs is essential for sustainable fisheries management and poverty reduction. And Mario presented the, the, the case of the Plataneras in the importance of uh, the bycatch in this, in this case. Also, Brazil, uh, for instance, is using byproducts uh, in school meals through public procurement process. Um, so, uh, fishers have act direct access to services and mar in markets. You now, and this increased nutritional value of meals and made the diet more diverse at a lower cost and also reaching uh, more children. So, social protection. Uh, is also very important to respond to sharks. The fisheries industry is vulnerable to these sharks. Um, and uh, social protection can effect, effectively respond to these challenges by providing a safety net to either respond to sharks or minimize their impact uh, before they, they even happen. No? So for example, social protection uh, programs such as unconditional cash transfers and cash or food for work can provide short-term support to respond to shock, such as in the case of uh, Mauritius, no, who has the bad weather allowance, which seeks to address weather and environmental shock. This program gives fishers a fixed monthly allowance uh, to those who cannot fish on bad weather uh, day. In addition, fishers are encouraged to engage in alternative activities, such as mending their nets, repairing their boats, when they are not involved in fishing activities uh, during this day. So similarly, there are, there are other programs such as the Fisheries ins uh, Life Insurance in the Maldives or the Public Work Programs in the Philippines, also, uh, which also takes the, the building back better approach you know, uh, and presents an opportunity to introduce improved practices and help small-scale fisher folk and more value uh, to, their, to their production. Also, community-based social protection uh, play a very important uh, role in compensating uh, when social protection is limited available um, from the, from the state-led program. 
So, however, several barriers uh, to access social protection still exist and need to be addressed. So these include, among others, the high informality rate in the sector, which affects the eligibility and participation of fishers uh, to access these programs, the low contributory capacity that hinders their ability to contribute to social protection schemes, the mistrust of government institutions that may, lay, may lead to a low uptake of available benefits, the lack of information or misinformation about benefits also create barriers to assessing social protection. And limited le legislative inclusion may exclude certain segments of the value chain from benefiting from this problem. So adapting uh, social protection to expand uh, its uh, coverage and adequacy to the fishery sector in order to deal with the barriers discussed requires careful attention to policy program design, delivery, and institutional uh, coordination. And I think also Mario gave a good, interesting presentation of what FAO is uh, helping and supporting together with the government of Colombia in terms of expanding the social protection to, to the fishery sector in the case of Colombia. But basically, uh, we are working now um, at the policy program design, delivery, and institutional coordination level. Also, policy frameworks and programs design should explicitly recognize the unique needs and vulnerabilities of fishers and their communities. So needs assessment is very important no, as an entry point. So this involves integrating fisheries specific considerations into social uh, protection policies, ensuring their relevance and effectiveness and tailoring social protection programs to these specific challenges faced uh, by the sector. So this may include developing insurance schemes for work-related injuries, unemployment benefits for seasonal um, uh, fisheries, income support during closed fishing seasons, flexibility in program design is crucial to address the diversity need, needs of, the, of this uh, sector. Um, efficient delivery mechanisms are essential also for the effective social protection implementation. And this involves establishing accessible channels for fisheries, for fishers to register, access benefits, and receive timely assistance. So mobile technology, for instance, can play a vital role in reaching remote fishing communities more efficient. And coordinated efforts among relevant institutions are crucial to align social protection and fisheries policies. So uh, FAO is working in a number of countries toward these interinstitutional uh, and uh, interdepartmental co coordination so we can align better fisheries management uh, and uh, social protection policies towards a better coherence as uh, explained uh, before. So this yeah. coordination effort uh, fosters a more effective uh, information sharing, avoids duplication of efforts and maximizes the the impact of both no social protection interventions uh, and, and management. So in conclusion, so the importance of social protection for inclusive blue transformation uh, in the fishery sector cannot uh, be overstated. So by providing a safety net and addressing barriers of, uh, to access, social protection programs empower fishers and their communities to navigate challenges and seize uh, better opportunities. So these programs can contribute to economic inclusion, enhance adaptive capacity, promote sustainable fisheries management, and they create the foundation of resilience, ensuring that no one is left behind uh, within this uh, blue transformation process that we are living. So I, I thank you very much um, for your attention and apologies for this technical uh, program and very happy to continue the discussion. Great. Many thanks, Daniela. And this this uh, conversation has been incredible and we're a bit of short of time, but we want to keep you here for another 15 minutes, if at all, uh, as we give the word to a former minister, a former minister from Peru, who knows this uh, topics really well. And as we said, we have Jose Luis Chicoma, and later we will have the special envoy from Iceland helping us to wrap up and really understand everything that we've analyzed here. So, Jose Luis, without further ado, thank you for being here with us. Thank you, Juan Gonzalo. Thank you for the very kind introduction and for the previous presentations, with, which were very interesting. As mentioned, I have served as Minister of Production in Peru 
a sector that is in charge of fisheries and aquaculture in a country that has one of the richest oceans in the world. I have faced actually many of the challenges that Professor Guy Standing has described in his presentation. Everything resonates well with me. Um, and as you might know, I come from a country, Peru, that is obsessed with, it, with its ceviche. We take uh, a lot of pride in our ceviche. Uh, and I have a friendly word of advice to the ones that are with us, which is never dare to tell any Peruvian that you have tasted better ceviche in another country. I would fear for your safety. However, we have uh, actually, this national pride has not translated into policies that prioritize the sustainability of our fish or its use to feed the most vulnerable. Today, uh, I'll face the challenge of keeping your attention after a few presentations without slides. I'll share these experiences from my time in, in as minister, three experiences, and these examples illustrate Many of the things that have been said about the challenges and opportunities we have in working towards including aquatic foods in social programs. And I'll start with experience number one, actually talking about ceviche and hunger. During the pandemic, Peru launched a temporary food assistance program to reach families in need. It was led by the Ministry of Social Inclusion in close coordination with the Ministry of Agriculture. I requested that the Ministry of Production, the one that I was leading, uh, should be included in a crucial role in this program due to the potential of blue foods to address food insecurity. However, I faced resistance, not from my colleagues, the Minister of Social Inclusion and the Minister of Agriculture shared many personal affinities with me regarding social justice, support for small scale farmers and artisanal fishers, and most importantly, an affinity for food systems uh, policies uh, to improve our food systems. But the resistance came from institutional mandates the fishing sector in Peru, like in many other fishing nations, has been managed with an economic perspective. The mandate of the Ministry of Production has always been to increase production. The institution's DNA is centered around catching more fish, not around sustainability or food security. Consequently, in these ceviche nations, policymakers do not consider fish as an essential food. This is mostly because the country's marine resources are mainly used to produce export commodities. The anchovy, which is the most abundant marine resource in Peru, is captured by industrial fisheries to produce fish meal, which is then exported for fish farming or livestock feed, usually in distant countries like, like China. So small scale fisheries account actually for two thirds of fish consumption in the country, a great part actually used to make ceviches. But policymakers have repeatedly ignored the potential of these artisanal fisheries to feed, to better feed the population. In the end, we managed during my period as minister to make significant progress in including blue foods in social protection and sustainability policies. We secured the approval of a legal framework to allocate a percentage of government food purchases exclusively to fish sourced from artisanal fishing and aquaculture. We also succeeded in implementing legal frameworks to protect important resources such as mahi-mahi, octopus, scallops, crabs, and many other species, which were threatened by overfishing and regulatory gaps. But my clear recommendation in this first, uh, first experience is related uh, to include all stakeholders when designing social programs, particularly the fishing sector when addressing food issues, which wasn't necessarily done in Peru, but more, important, more importantly, we need to change institutional mandates. As long as the ministries and agencies that are in charge for food production, as long as these agencies focus only on economic objectives, is going to be challenging to achieve meaningful change. We need to align our goals better to ensure policy coherence among food, environmental, and economic policies. And this brings me to my next experience. How difficult is it to introduce sustainable and inclusive fish in school meals? In short, it is very complex. Peru has experienced implementing social programs for, more, for the most vulnerable. It has operated cash transfer programs for 
uh, almost uh, two decades. It has addressed specific nutritional deficiencies through food assistance policies. However, most of these policies are often disconnected from production and sustainability. The state frequently purchases processed products from large companies for its food programs, neglecting the potential of local production and biodiversity and disregarding local consumption preferences. I have also often asked public officials that are in charge of the, of the programs in social development ministries, I have asked them about food programs, how can they achieve multiple objectives beyond nutrition? I usually ask, can we purchase more fresh foods? Can we include more fruits and vegetables in these programs? Can we buy fresh produce from small scale farmers and artisanal fishers? Can we request sustainable production with fewer chemical fertilizers, herbicides and pesticides? Can we encourage through these programs our agroecological and sustainable production? Can we include in these programs more biodiverse products that, that respect local preferences? Can we use these programs to rescue forgotten foods that need domestic markets instead of disappearing? These questions often horrify many of these public officials because they would face an extremely complex set of challenges. They now face the challenge of delivering uh, calories. And that is difficult when you don't have uh, sufficiently enough developed social protection mechanisms, but including all of these objectives would be very difficult and complex. But the good news is that it's possible. It requires uh, patience and maybe blood, sweat and tears. But Daniela has already put up some examples uh, mentioned a few examples like Brazil. Brazil demonstrated in the previous Lula administration with its zero hunger program that uh, you can have a program that mandates the purchase of food from small scale farmers, prioritizing local products and sustainability. However, to massively include sustainable fish in large scale food programs, we need to implement many other related policies. This includes supporting the processing of products from artisanal fishers, improving transportation infrastructure, developing cold chains, modernizing traditional markets, and much more. Many times these policies uh, and investment related with these policies have prioritized the promotion of food exports. Public policies and investments on infrastructure in developing countries have usually favored export-oriented food industries rather than encouraging local food production. This neglect, neglect has resulted in healthy diets, including aquatic foods being expensive and unaffordable for a significant portion of the population. And the recommendation here is very clear also, but complex. We must develop strong social protection institutions that are capable of achieving what seems very difficult, such as the widespread inclusion of fresh fish in school meal programs. And this leads me to the last and brief experience that I'll share uh, which is the potential of aquaculture. For a long time, I was skeptical about the potential of aquaculture. I had concerns about waste management and the nutritional quality of its products and how fish are fed with other fish like Guy Standing mentioned. However, I also acknowledged the potential of sustainable land-based aquaculture to change lives and improve livelihoods, uh, livelihoods especially at a time when many ocean species are being overexploited and reaching the limits of sustainable exploitation. During one of my first trips as minister, I visited an aquaculture training center in the heart of the Peruvian Amazon, near the city of Iquitos. Indigenous communities from all over the Amazon came to learn how to farm local species like the delicious paiche. They were provided free accommodation for a month and then took their near, near, newly acquired knowledge back to their villages, enabling these marginalized communities to feed themselves and to earn decent incomes. However, one thing disappointed me. The center not only used chemical fertilizers, but also promoted their widespread use, similar to practices in agro-industry. As you know, aquaculture waste is saturated with minerals and nutrients posing serious environmental risks. Yet the center treated its wastewater as if it were clean water. When I raised my concerns, the staff assured me that there was no problem. It was only clean water. 
I was very disappointed. And it, uh, this was happening in the heart of the Amazon, one of the richest and most biodiverse places on earth. As a result, we made sustainable agriculture a priority in another visit to the city of Yurimawas. Also in the Amazon, I regained some hope. Our ministry's financial support had been used to establish a technologically advanced aqu aquaculture facility where all waste was recycled and solar power was the main energy source. The fish, the fish produced uh, there were sold in domestic and international markets, although they remained expensive due to the high investment required for this sustainable technology. This made the resulting products unaffordable for the general public, probably like for those that needed the most. A similar case occur, occurred with a fishing innovation center in the city of Tarapoto, which is a region that is between the Amazon and the Andes. We trained small and medium entrepreneurs in sustainable aquaculture combined with a hydroponic production of plants and vegetables, this model known as aquaponics. The feed was sustainable and mostly plant-based. This approach holds significant, significant potential for sustainable and nutritious food production. However, the same problem, the delicious products resulting from these efforts remain too expensive for those who need it the most. So how can we make these products more affordable? The government is the main buyer for social programs such as school meals, hospitals, prisons. Leveraging the, the potential of these programs can make nutritious and sustainable food more accessible. And this would provide people with diverse and nutritious products that are also sustainable. Mm -hmm. In conclusion, achieving policy coherence between fishing, social protection, and food policies is crucial. It's going to require, of course, hard work on designing and implementing these programs. It requires and it needs political will to change the statu quo. It, it requires food champions, coalitions, and more events like this, where we share evidence and experiences that promote this transformation. Thank you very much for your attention. Well, thank you very much uh, for this very, very inspiring talk. And I'm, I'm really happy that we share the same passion for school meals and integration of uh, aquatic and blue food into school meals, hospital meals, and so on. And as a former city councillor and chairman of a, a committee for education, I was responsible for school meals in Reykjavik. And I always regret not having insisted on what you were talking about, uh, uh, purchasing more healthy food from local resources. That was uh, the mistake I made. So now I know better. <laughs> but thank you very much, all of you. It's It's been extremely rewarding and, and I agree. We need to meet again and talk more. Uh, we have exhausted our time more or less. Uh, I, I'm not going to reflect on each one of the individual presentations. I don't think we have time for that, but I would like to give each one of you one minute only for a final round for the benefit of our, our, uh, our audience. But I can see there are three questions uh, coming in on, on the Q&A. So, uh, OK, Barbara Vest is very active. Uh, she has a question for the professor standing. And, and there's a question from Natalie Wright. Should we stop eating fish uh, to make sure that we are not harming the ocean? Coming from Peru or Iceland, I don't think we would agree to that. We would say we just have to make sure that the fish is sustainably fished. We treat it in Colombia, of course. We have to be careful with the value chains, the fishing methods, the management of everything. But And we have to make sure that everybody knows that we are accountable and we are taking note of the, the, the need for to protect biodiversity, to keep the ocean healthy, and so on. And for that matter, we have several legal instruments through FAO, through others who are actually take, try to make certain that we can certify and be accountable that the fish we offer on the international market or local market is actually um, okay, sustainably fished, sustainably made. Um, first of all, uh, so I will go in, in uh, to Colombia first, uh, Mario Rueda, and ask you for your final comments in one one go and then I'll wrap up in the end. But Mario, give, me, give us your one minute or so after this uh, great meeting. Okay, thank you. Okay, I, I want to say that the, 
the social for uh, the social pro the social pro for fees project to promote the identification and mechanisms to contribute to breaking down the barriers to access to the social protection contribute contribution to inclusive and resilient social transformation. This project in this moment in Colombia is very important. You know that the Colombia have a new government with a several thinking, okay, philosophy. So a social aspect is very important. So we need to combine these, uh, these opportunities with these issues uh, to promote the importance of social protection in a small scale fisheries. I, I totally agree with you. I found it extremely interesting that in your program, you are looking at CO2 emission. You are talking, yeah. talking about loss and, and waste and, and value addition, and as well as fisheries and nutrition. So the whole linkage is there. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay. Daniela, I have a question for you. Uh, I promised you a free for a free minute. It's not entirely free. The, you said that, what, 64, 65% of the fish uh, we capture fisheries is actually sustainably fished to a maximum yield. So how confident is FAO that this is actually true, that the data is actually telling the truth, that the situation is not worse? Well, uh, as, you, as you know, we have, we have uh, a number of methods you know, that we are using uh, we we triangulate this uh, this uh, information the data received, and we we try. I mean, we convene um, the different experts you now uh, to 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 come up with the like the most accurate uh, number that you that that we can have. So so we are pretty confident uh, in terms of uh, of the data that we are that we are gathering and the data that we are analyzing. Uh, and we are, uh, of course, making uh, improvements uh, every day, you know, by building capacity uh, at the country level for some of the countries that do not have uh, a very accurate or good data collection system. So FAO is there building their capacities. Uh, so, so I think, I mean, basically, it, it's really working with, uh, you see, with the governments, with the science, with the fishers themselves. So we kind of tri triangulate, uh, triangulate mm. that, yeah. Okay, uh, no, because in this debate, we, we use FAO as our source of reference for everything we say usually. And congratulations on your blue transformation strategy. It's now been put into the uh, your work stream. So now you're authorized to have it uh, go for the ambitious goals of the blue transformation. Yes, thank you. We count on the support, of course, of, of everyone. This is not an FAO concept; is a concept of the member countries uh, of FAO. No, so we are we are there together, no, uh, in order really to achieve a much better future. And I think, I mean, some of the results that I, I showed in the presentation are promising. Of course, a lot more needs to be done, but I think slowly we are making some progress. And I think the results that Mario, for instance, presented at the country level. Are basically the foundations, though, of the of those statistics that that we are presenting. Sure, I'm looking forward to see you at FAO conference later on. Thank you. Very yeah, much. likewise, likewise. Uh, 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 Professor Standing, you have a question from from Barbara Best. Do you support tenure-based governance systems of the Commons, or view these as a form of privatization? Well, and let me answer that question very quickly. That I believe that commons-based governance and commons-based communities run by commoners is the best way forward. They are the people with most interest in reproducing a viable, sustainable community and with the resource base. I think one of the biggest dangers is when it's, when it's uh, commanded by external forces and finance most of all, because finance goes for short-term profit-making. And as I said in my talk, I think it's very important that we, we treat the financial involvement of financial capital in the blue economy as a threat, not as a savior. And I think I try and show that in the book. The second point I'd like to make is that the trouble with the official data from FAO or other sources 
is that at the same time, a lot of people are saying one of the biggest problems in the sea is illegal, unrecorded, unreported fishing. And if you say that over 50% of uh, fish may be uh, that IUU, um, it's very it's difficult to give much credence to official figures, even if they are adjusted in this way or another. And I was very struck by the, the reconstruction, uh, uh, catch reconstruction data by Dan Pauli and others, which actually shows that the official figures are something like 53% under-reported. Now, we can quibble about that. We can have discussions, and I'm sure there are both sides to the question. But I think the one should always specify when you show official figures that these are guesstimates, not hard facts. And then the other part I'd just like to conclude on is that I'm very pleased that in the book, I propose that aquaculture companies, the industrial companies, are paying about 50% of the production costs and imposing 50% on communities. And therefore, it's justified to have a high uh, industrial agriculture levy, which would go into the fund I talked about. And since I wrote the book, I'm very pleased that the Norwegian government has come out with a policy. First, it was going to be 40%, then the aquaculture companies like Maui and others objected, and it's now they've agreed on 25%. But 25% is, is a fair start, and it means that we're getting resources that can be re recycled to give protection to the small-scale communities that are being blighted by industrial aquaculture. That's the sort of measure we need to take. Yeah, well, this has not gone unnoticed in other countries such as Iceland, let me tell you that. But uh, to tell you the truth, I, I had started reading your book before I knew we would meet here. Uh, I haven't finished, uh, but uh, I'd like to contact you later about it. But I can just, I want to- Well, I, I, enjoyed coming, I enjoyed coming to Iceland and talking to Icelandic fishermen and going out on their boats. So it's, oh. it's an important part of the book. They were very educational. I love coming to Iceland. Uh, oh, great. But uh, I, I would certainly, well, I think we, both agree, Iceland and Peru, that the, the 200 miles economic zone is very important for us, to tell sure. the truth. Yeah, you know sure. that we, we need the sure. three cod, we need the three cod, the three wars. cod wars. <laughs> <laughs> to get the British out. And, you, and you, won all, you won all three, you won all three. <laughs> yeah, true, true, true. So, so we have an issue with you on the enclosed. I don't think we have uh, something good there. No, I think framework. the EEZ, the EEZ could have been good. But I think the privatization uh, in quota systems is something which, is, which has been disastrous. And I discussed that in the book. Maybe you haven't reached that part of the book yet. But, uh, yeah. but anyhow, I look forward to continuing dialogue with you and with others. I've really enjoyed listening. It's very, very mm -hmm. important. Jan Gonzalo and I have already agreed that we will continue our cooperation. So, <laughs> but so Chikoma, I will, I will finish with you. Your one minute of fame. Go ahead, please. <laughs> um, so thank you. Yes, just just a couple of reflections. Uh, one that is related with institutional mandates that there's a question there from Barbara Best. And I think, yeah, we can start with working groups on food systems like many countries have started. But if we really want to move forward, we have to redesign many of these institutions. As long yeah. as you have ministries and agencies that are in charge of food production with an economic mandate uh, is going to be very difficult to change the system, no? Because your, your mandate, what people demand from you, your stakeholders, the media, and the other people in government is to increase production, to increase food, food production. It, it doesn't matter if it's unsustainable. We can say that we're trying to be more green, but if we don't have it more clearly defined Mm -hmm. In our mandates, it's not going to change. So um, a, a way forward is to, to, to make everything more complex and to include nutritional, sustainability, and other mandates that relates with a systemic perspective on food. That's what we should propose in the long term. Now, in the short term, yes, we can start with a, with a multi-stakeholder group that works on food system approaches. Yes, that's, that's going to work, but not in the long term. 
and also um, what uh, Professor Standin says on, on, on the quotas resonates well with me. Uh, they, they seem to be working for the private sector because, um, because of the resources for the long term for them doesn't work in an ecosystemic way. And the ecosystemic way is, are we going to favor the interests of these big industrial groups or are we going to favor the most important interests of the people that need uh, food to eat, nutritious food? And that's a big question. And the quotas for specific uh, fisheries don't address the ecosystemic need. And, and, and that's very difficult to move forward. Uh, uh, on that note, we have to conclude the discussion. Uh, thank you all very much. I'm, I'm really happy to have been uh, invited to be a member of this very important meeting. I wish I could have you all over to my table for a quick cup of coffee today and have, uh, continue the discussion. That would have to go on later. Uh, uh, but the the okay. So the the we are done. Thank you very much, and looking forward to continue in a later stage. Goodbye, everybody. Bye. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.